Hello, everybody, and welcome to Meeples and Wine, your podcast for game reviews for couples with wine. I am Michael. And I am Susie. And what wine are we tasting today? Today we are tasting the Juggernaut Hillside Cabernet 2020. There's Mm. so much going on on this label. There's like a lion that looks like it's made out of fire and weeds and all sorts of cool stuff. Yes, we picked it out because of the art. Yeah. We picked it. We went to the store looking for bottles of wine that had cats on them. Yeah, we couldn't find any with domestic cats. We found one that had puppies all over it. Yeah. Two brands that had the same brand that had puppies all over the label. Nothing with cats. We found one with a naked lady. <laughs> we found one with a manticore. Yeah. Yeah. A manticore. And uh, this one has a lion. Uh, I'll put it in the show notes. And these are very aggressive wines. <laughs> the, they make a Chardonnay that has like a great white shark. Mm-hmm. eating a koala or something on there. Yeah, I don't even know. No. It's ridiculous. <laughs> and the reason we're looking for a cat-themed bottle is because we are playing Bezier's Games Cat in the Box. The Quantum Trick-Taking Game. Deluxe mm. edition for two to five players. Mm-hmm. Which is why we picked it up. Because they have special two-player rules. We will get to that in just a moment. But right now, we are going to crack open this bottle of wine. Suzanne, could you tell them a little bit about this wine while I cork it? Yeah, so the Juggernaut... Wine is grown on a mountainous terrain. So these hillside vineyards have less access to water, the rockier soil also holding fewer nutrients. These conditions stress the vines, resulting in the production of a fraction of the fruit of most vineyards. But the the harsh environment causes the vines to struggle, yielding fewer clusters and smaller berry size. The result is berries that are loaded with rich, ripe, intensely concentrated flavors and complexity. Of course, that was from... And I'll tell you, just from smelling the cork... Mm, it smells smooth. Smells smooth? All right, let's I taste this one. Say that. Okay, give me a ting. Ooh, he's got a real big nose. For the taste. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, it's been that kind of day. Ooh, I don't know that's can- like, I mean, we didn't even give it time to breathe. That's pretty smooth. Mm-hmm. It is dry. A, dry at the end. Which I like. Yeah. Kind of smoky. Yeah, it's very rich. It's got almost like a woodsy. Yeah. Like a like a woodsy. Like if you were I don't say if you go in the go in the forest and munch on a piece of bark. <laughs> go lick a tree. No. And it's, it's much tasty than that. Yeah. Well, I mean, you know what it is? Because it was vented for eleven months in French oak barrels. So that's what you're tasting there. That's what that is. The flavor profile they have for it is dense and velvety with vanilla and ripe black currants. I get more of um, like not a vanilla, like you think you think like vanilla or like an ice cream. I don't get vanilla. Uh -uh. But I get vanilla, but more like a a a vanilla bourbon extract type of. No, vanilla bourbon. I think it's called pronounced bourbon. No, it's. (laughs) I'm looking this up while you're tasting. Tell us what you think. I like. It it does. It smell. It tastes like smooth velvet, dark velvet. I'm kind of getting the grape a little bit at the beginning. Mm-hmm. How to pronounce bourbon <laughs> You're really vanilla? Looking that up. I am looking at it. It's bourbon. It's vanilla being soaked or vanilla soaked in bourbon. Bourbon vanilla. <laughs> well, this is stupid. <laughs> when I was at Trader Joe's, they told us to say it bourbon. <laughs> no. Screw Trader Joe's. <laughs> Because you can either make it in vodka or you can make it in bourbon. So vanilla. that's okay. So either way, this bourbon it has almost like the bourbon vanilla, not like a not like a extract that you would do from like an Everclear. Yeah. Okay. I could get high, that. Yeah. High alcohol content one. Yeah. I'm drinking it too. That's the thing is now I want a, I want a steak. I want, but not yeah. like I want a nice rare. Yeah. You could pair this probably with chocolate. Yeah. Do it, but dark a nice chocolate. dark chocolate like a German really chocolate rich. cake. Yeah, like the cook this when they cook the steaks right in the garlic butter. Well, not even that, just that real steak that mouth. Yeah, this is this is a meat wine. Mm -hmm. So this one was. I'm gonna go sit over here and finish this. But this was a cabernet. Yeah, this is cabernet sauvignon. A hillside vineyards, like Suzanne said, these are all like 45 degree angle hills. Well, and even, sir, I don't and know. steeper, and it's California one. So because they said it's even a challenge for the mm-hmm. work. So they deliberately stress the vines to produce less grapes that have more juice. I have found that to be true about a lot of fruit. The smaller fruit, the groceries mm-hmm. have more flavor. Oh yeah, that's why the wild blueberries are so much more delicious than yeah. the big old thumb small, size. It's ones. like 
everything becomes more concentrated, a smaller package. And you can fit more in your nose. <laughs> in your nose? This one, okay, now Suzanne said earlier, this, I put this rating on there, 4.2 out of 5 rating on Vivino with 39,592 ratings. Is that just a website, Vivino? Vivino is the uh, app, or like it's kind of like the, the beer app Oh, where you scan it. And now, on the buy and buy, Meeples and Wine is on Vivino. So if you'd like to follow us, we're going to start posting all the wines that we have on there. And oh, if you have any cool. suggestions for us, send us to us on our Vivino link, which will be in the show notes. All right, now we are going to talk about a new purchase is Cat in the Box Deluxe version from Bezier Games. Am I saying that right, you think? Mm. They're French. You know some French. Well, then it would be Bezier. Bezier Games, then. <laughs> but it ends with an R. So, and we say our R's in America. Mm-hmm. Bezier Games. Bezier, Bezier Games. Bezier. But it is a trick-taking game for two to five players. The interesting thing about this is that w- most trick-taking games involve a Trump color trump suit that sort of thing this one you don't know what color the card is until you actually play it well the story of the game is that it's an experiment and the cats are in boxes and you don't know what color the cat is until you open the box Mm -hmm. open the box play the card Mm -hmm. so all the cards are actually black and white and they all have numbers on them and then you choose the color of particular card when you play it right and the way you choose the color is every first off everybody gets a player card that has each of the four colors on it so you've got blue green red and yellow Mm -hmm. okay red is trump you put your tokens which the tokens are super cute little plastic ones that look like atoms or little little mice yeah they look like clear little gems but like one's a flask yeah one's an erlenmeyer flask one's a and everybody gets their own set so i think i had all the mice yeah you had the mice they're all different Mm -hmm. colors they're really cute i mean it's definitely a nice deluxe version of it the previous version that came out in 2020 was all cardboard Mm -hmm. pieces and that this one also has the experiment board with the research board and on the research board you take cards slide them into the top and that slots in one, two, three, four, five across the board. And those are the cards, depending on how many players you have. So like with just me and Susie playing, we only use the cards that went through one to five. Right. But if you've got all five players, you could go one through nine. Right. Or varying <clears throat> in between, depending on how many players you have. Well, one thing that I didn't notice, and Bezier games, Bezier games, I really like is that if you look at the cards, there's little numbers on the cards and numbers on the player boards and everything. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Or one, two, three, four, five, one, the two, three, are, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. No. What? For little, the ones in the little white circles. That tells you you use these cards for these many players. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's so. right. Because some of them are, are they're double-sided. So some of them you use one side for a certain number and the right. other side you use for a different number of players. So yeah. you have a grid of four by five, six, seven, eight, nine, depending on how many people are playing. And you get your hand of cards, which is 10 cards. Discard the first one, mm-hmm. and then decide randomly, or whoever was the last person to touch a catty cat goes first, which will never be me. Right. Then you've got the first play. So first play goes, you put a card down to start the play round. Whatever that card is, is the played color. So it can be green, yellow, or blue. You cannot play the Trump color red unless Trump has already been broken, meaning you have no other choice but to play a red card. Right. So you you, can only play a red card if you don't have the lead color. Right. That goes back to the player board, because the player board has four slots with all four colors on there. And you could, if you've got the right hand, I guess, I mean, if you have all the numbers, you could conceivably say, I don't have any more blue, yellow, or green in my hand. Or you just don't have that lead color anymore. Like, if you led blue... I could just declare I don't have any more blue, and then I could play a red card. Right. Or any other color. Well, I'm saying one of the, one of the things, you do, if you have a good, really good hand that you conceivably could do it all in one, you could say, I only have red cards in my hand and get rid oh. of them. But the catch is, once you say you don't have any yellow cards, mm-hmm. you literally cannot play any more your yellow cards. Those, right. those don't exist for you anymore. So that's why you use the markers on your player card. To show that you have already said that you don't have any more yellow, then you won't forget late three rounds later. And right, so you take your little you mouse or yellow. little Erlenmeyer flask off or whatever to show that you don't have any of that more co- any of that color anymore. You get a bonus 
Well, that's a, that, that gets the scoring. That's going to be a little bit down the line. It's good, the gameplay itself. So yeah. Suzanne plays four yellow. Mm-hmm. Okay, I can look at my hand. I have a four, five, six, seven, eight, whatever. I then look at the board because when she plays it, she takes one of her tokens and puts it on the four yellow spot on, on the, the research board. Research board, right. That card cannot be played anymore. We have discovered the four yellow. There are no more four yellows. So right. There's I can, only one color of each number cat. Mm-hmm. But there's five of each card. Right. So at the beginning of the game, you're allowed to discard a card. So if I have too many fours in my hand, I might discard a four because I don't want to get stuck not being able to play it. So if you draw four you, and you you draw and you have three fours, you're like, I got to get rid of those because I'm wind up having a... Um, a paradox. A paradox. So I have nothing but fours in my hand and all the fours have been played and the spots are filled. That's a paradox. Bad things happen when you have a paradox. The um, game ends <clears throat> Im- immediately as soon as there's a paradox. Well, not the game. The hand ends immediately if right, there's a right, paradox. Right, the hand. One of the things we forgot to mention at the beginning is this game really, if you don't have a third player, really doesn't work well. So what they've done in lieu of having a third player is you only use the cards one through five for two players, mm-hmm. which when you deal them out, I get 10, you get 10, there's five left over. You deal out those five, choose three of them, and then put the tokens on the board to cover three cards that that hand had and it starts with the green one and moves upward from there so if you have a one and a two and a two you'd put a token on the green one the green two and i think yellow is right above green right so whatever the color is above green you put those off now those cards have been discovered and cannot be played right yeah at the so very beginning. three places on the board are automatically used up before we even start the game let's say you have three fours in your hand you flip the cards to and one invisible. of them's a four. <laughs> or both, or two of them's a four. You have two twos oh, or two yeah. fours in there. Now two of the fours have been covered. You're sitting there with three of them in your hand. Better get rid of those because one of those fours doesn't exist. Mm-hmm. There's a lot of strategy in, you have to pay attention to the research board because you may think that you'll be able to play like in any other trick-taking game. Oh, I have king, a red king. I can play that on my next turn after this. But you don't know what cards do or don't exist yet. You can't be sure that the card that you have in your hand is going to exist by the time you play it. So a lot of the strategy has to do with avoiding getting a paradox. Because right. the whole scoring thing at the end, normally you get one point for every trick that you have gained. But if you're the one who had a paradox and ended the game, now all those tricks are negative points. Right. So if you are really cranking it out on one hand and you've got five, six tricks that, that you have taken, mm-hmm. you finish off with a paradox you get negative points on that. Right. And they mark it off. There's a cute little, looks like a um, clipboard for the score pad. There's a lot of really cool little accessories in this game, including that. It looks like you're doing a science experiment. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But my favorite thing is that little piece, this little foam that they put in there to keep the little tokens from falling around everywhere. (laughs) So you put them in their little slots, get them organized, and you put that on over the top of them. And then they stay there. And that's nice because they don't rattle around and stuff. Yeah. It's a great game. It really is. There's, like I said, there's a lot of strategy. You have to pay attention to the to the board mm-hmm. and figure out what you have. You have to kind of guess. You oh, keep... we didn't talk about the bonus points. Oh yeah, the bonus points. If you have four or less tricks in a turn, this is for two player. For two players, you then get to score bonus points by how many tokens you have sequentially on the board. Yeah, research board. Where yeah. you were tracking what color of each number that you played. So, but they have to be lined up or adjacent to each other. They yeah. can they can make right turns on the board, but yeah. they have to be. It has to make a chain. Yeah, you have a chain of them. It can go up, down, left, right, not diagonal. So that's actually another viable strategy. In fact, I won a couple hands playing that because that. Mm-hmm. I had a crap hand, and I was like, ah, okay, I'm not going well, to... Well, like, you had three tricks, and I had five, but then you got all the bonus points and wound up with eight or something. Yeah, because I managed to chain together all these. Then I focused on that one hand, on just chaining together my mm-hmm. tokens. Mm-hmm. One of the things that happens in the multiplayer game is you have to predict how many hands, or how many... Huh, how many hands? How many tricks. How many tricks you're going to take. Mm-hmm. So I think... I, I don't know what the numbers are on the card, so it's like three, four, and six, or whatever it is on there, but you uh-huh. ha- if you manage to win as many of the ones that you have predicted, you get the bonus score then. Whereas in the two-player game, you get the bonus score if you have scored four or less. Right. You can force your opponent to win. To get more tricks than you. Yeah. yeah. So mm-hmm. you can... you can To because, get more than four tricks and right. then they can't get the bonus points. The, you could also try to force them to get a paradox so they get negative points for their tricks. Mm-hmm. Yep. 
there's lots like of cool that. stuff you can do in them. And, and that's, that's like trick taking games are for me have never been awesome. I don't, I, I used to like playing trick taking games, but we haven't actually played them for a long time. Like yeah. I used to play Euchre and Hearts and Spade. After a while, you're just like, okay, I gotta play something else. This, I think the research board and the choosing of what color you have puts enough of a random element in there that you can't lie back on any sort of traditional trick game now, the strategies. Only thing is, usually with trick-taking games, I have trouble remember what's already been played and what's left in the deck. Right. And with this, because you have your board to keep track of what color has been played, you know. To me, that took away an element from the trick-taking games that made it challenging. Well, I mean, it gives you a little bit more of a helper on that, but at the same time, remember, you can't you can't go back and look at your cards. Once you take the trick and put the cards face down, you... Yeah, but you know what number has been played because it's it's being kept track of on the um, experiment board. Yeah, but you don't... I mean, are you going to remember who won with each of those cards? Yeah, I mean... I know what's left in my hand because I can see it. I think there's a couple things in there that do give you a little bit more of assistance, but I think the randomness sort of it you know not knowing what i'd like to play with more players and see we definitely need to because it was so fast with two players and only the cards were only one through five Mm -hmm. it just it went so fast boom 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 yeah for a two-player game it it is a nice fast game for Mm -hmm. four players i think there would be more going on well you're like deliberating which color you should choose right yeah and then the other thing is there's different uh, number cards that you slot into the research board. So you can have one through five for the two-player game. goes one to nine for the five-player game. There's two sides to these cards. So the one, they, one that they have set oh, up to is... to make it more challenging, yeah. You could flip the board over, or no, flip the cards over and play the dark side slot in the observation in the research, board. research board, right. Then instead of them being all the ones lined up and all the twos lined up and all the threes lined up, it's staggered. Yeah. So, so at the that end of makes it, putting trying to line up your tokens a little different. Yeah, because at the end you only have like one nine, two eights, three sevens, four sixes. It starts. There's one set of them that has only has one nine. Did it? Yeah. I thought it still had the nines. They were just di- placed diagonally. Yeah, but it was placed. It it had no. It was placed. There was blank spots on there. I thought I thought it still had the four nine. I mean, the box is right there. You can take a look. But there's enough variety in the gameplay on this that you'd be able to um, that you'd be able to make the changes. What? And give me the box. Oh, sorry. So here you go. Ah. But uh, yeah, no, it's like I said. There's enough variety in the game, and it says it takes about thirty minutes to play, which is true. They got it's a nice tight game. It doesn't take real long to learn it, nor does it take a long time to play it. The, uh, hey. What? I'm literally showing you what I told you exists. Yeah, but see, nine, 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 they're just diagonal. Yeah, but there's only one red nine. Well, that's always. But I mean. There's always only one color of each number. They're just lined up differently. Instead of being in a straight line up and down, they're diagonal. So when you place your tokens, it just, it makes it different when you're trying to place your tokens. Well, I guess that would make a difference in, if you're trying to get a chain. Right. That's what so. I'm talking about. It makes it more challenging, especially if you have one of the ones on the end, like a red nine or a green one. Yeah. I will say that the cards are very nice. Mm-hmm. They're kind of the uh, textured ones. Yes. They have a little bit of They're cross-hatching. They're very quality, quality Good, materials. solid cards. Good. Co- well, it is the deluxe version. Yeah. We also have a couple of Bezier games also. We've got the One Night Werewolf, and the cards in that one are also very nice. Yeah. Yeah. To which, Bezier Games, we oh, just saw that. Oh, that's why they have the werewolf on there. Um, yeah, that was the first one, the simple. first game that they ever had. We saw your deluxe, super deluxe werewolf game. We really want to play that. Yeah. want to get a group of people over and play that one. No, I still have not played One Night Werewolf. No? You guys played it, and I kind of watched, and that was it. Oh, we got to get a group of people and play it together. We had too many people, because it was with the family and the cousins thing. Yeah. And they all liked to play the Everybody board games wanted to play the game. game. But yeah, this one, what would you give this on a fun rating? I think I say the same number every time. I'm. I was gonna say a seven. I think I just. I got a little bored because I. Of, like I said earlier, I didn't have the challenge of trying to remember what color cards had been played. You know what I mean? Right. Because they were already on the board. I mean, they're marked out for you. I mean, did because, that take away from the fun for you? Um, it just made it simpler. Well, like on Board Game Geek, they gave it a weight of one point eight two out of five for complexity, and I think I just. 
I need it a little bit more complex to keep it interesting. Which may may happen with the with more players, with right? More players, yeah. Right. So I wonder, I wonder what games on here would actually turn out to a five. What is a five out of five for complexity in board game geek? In board game geek. I don't. I have. I'm sure they're there because some of those euro games. No, the the ones were like where you have to keep track of all of your war games. No, like your supplies, like wheat and you know, like settlers of Catan. Oh, resource management game. Resource management. Thank you very so, much. I. <laughs> don't think Catan's going to be that. Well, I don't know that that one's that complicated, but there are some resource management games that just get crazy complicated. You know what I'm wondering? War of the Ring. War of the Ring. You're going to look for it? Yeah. War of the Ring 2004. That's the version I have. War of the Ring is still a 3.85 out of complexity. Hmm. That's crazy. What about Warhammer? <laughs> <laughs> I don't even know. I'll have to dig into this a little bit. But yeah, we're talking about the cat in the box. It's it's a great game. It's well, well put together. We have to try it with multiple people, but I think for a two-player fast-playing game, it's a good evening. You can play a couple games. We initially played it not scoring just to get the idea of how well we can play the tricks. And then we then we started scoring the last couple games, but just getting the whole gist of it. Like I said, there's enough choices in strategy. Yeah, I mean, it was more interesting because of... I think I'm going to give this one an 8. Okay. 8 out of 10 for fun. What about... Making the marriage rough. Mm. You know, we st- we've got start again. Woo, good game. Two, that was fun. That was okay. Breakfast is awkward and two Christmases. <laughs> I don't know if anything's ever going to be two because we're used to playing games together. But, uh... I don't know. I think I think that was fun. I don't think it's anything that's going to cause For strife. marriage survival? Yeah. Because it wasn't very one-sided. It wasn't like heavily weighted for one player over another. Yeah. It's not like we were playing Marvel vs. Capcom and you were spamming the gun on clay- cable or anything <laughs> like that. So yeah. there you go. We got an 8 from me on this one. We got a 7 for Suzanne on this one. Both agree that it's a number 2 for Marriage Survival score. And Cat in the Box will put a link to it to Amazon on our show notes. Uh, you can to... also pick it up from BezierGames.com. They're there. I don't know if that's a dot .com, my, but I will put their link on there also. <laughs> Runs about, I've seen, 25 to 30 bucks. Yeah. yeah. And it's worth it. And it's a small box. It'd yeah. be easy to take with you somewhere. You're going to do a link to the Juggernaut yes. Hillside Cabernet, too. Juggernaut Hillside Cabernet will be in the yeah. show notes also. Some upcoming games that we have. Mm-hmm. Got Goonies, Never Say Die, which is going to be coming up soon. This one's going to be a multiplayer one. We have more than two players on this because it kind of plays out like D&D. The Goonies one. The Goonies one. Remind looking at the rule set, it kind of reminded me of a D and D Goonies uh, Hero Craft type game where yeah, you have little individual. I think we'll enjoy it just play. because we like Goonies so yeah. much. And there's an expansion too. Huh. Uh, Quicksilver, which is the Zeppelin racing game, King mm-hmm. of New York, giant monsters fighting it out over New York. It's actually the sequel to King of Tokyo. I was going to say, is that the King of Tokyo type? Yeah. yeah. That was good. And uh, Boss Monster, which is it's a um, deck building game where you're playing adventurers going into a dungeon. Cool. Yeah. I think we need to put a survey up about what game we should buy next. Yeah, we could do that. Yeah. I'll do that. Okay. That would be great. Because we've got a list and it's getting longer and longer and longer. Okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Everybody vote Blood on the Clock Tower, please. No. Well, that's not a two-player game, though. I know, but it's awesome looking. I don't know. See, that's the thing, though. So now we were looking at this game. I was going on their web, Bezier's website, and mm-hmm. they have, like, a version of Blood on the Clock Tower, and it has all these super little cool... There's a little... Oh, there's, there's like a, a deluxe version? Yeah, they've got a gavel oh for whoever How the judge is. How much was that? It runs about the same as Blood on the Clock Tower. I saw it was, like, 120. Really? But it has a, a sandwich, for reasons that I don't understand. Give and me a, a gavel, sandwich? And, um... Like a uh, crucifix, some sort, something or other Wait, in what there. What is this for? This is for a uh, super deluxe werewolf, oh, one night werewolf. Where, one night, one night. Werewolf. Yeah, I think they build out like it. It runs in the same, like in the same gameplay style as Blood well, on the yeah, Clock Tower. Yeah, they're both like social deduction. Yep. Type games. We are actually going to be at the Midwest Gaming Classic, which at the end of March yeah. or beginning of April. Yeah, yeah. Going to be on April first. At 3.30 on the bonus stage, Mm -hmm. which is near the cafeteria, from what I understand. I don't know. We'll find out when we get there. But we're going to do a little Q&A. We're going to do a game review of a game that we have 
demoed and or bought on the dealer floor. A little lesson on how to do your own wine tasting. Mm -hmm. Figure out what you like and what you don't like. Yeah. And maybe some gifts and other cool stuff. Yeah, we're working on that too. Getting some cool stuff for you guys. We would love to see you out there if you are a fan and in the Milwaukee, Wisconsin area coming yeah. out. Say Let hello. Us know. Please be the one voice in the wild that comes back and says that we're listening. I've heard of you. You're on a podcast. Yeah. Okay. Certain, there's certain people that have said, oh, you're on a podcast? Yeah, we do a podcast. Susie and I do a podcast. Oh, what channel is it on? You don't listen to podcasts. <laughs> what <laughs> so, channel? Okay. Yeah. But if you would like to know more about us or ask us some questions or follow us, then we're going to post things that we're doing. We are on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at uh, Aunt Meeples and Wine. We're also on Meeples and Wine at gmail.com. You can leave us a voicemail at SpeakPipe. Link in the show notes. Link is in the show notes. And if you like the show, please uh, share it out. Share it with a friend. Tell them about it. Tell people about the show. And send them a link. Yes. So they'll actually click it. Correct. <laughs> click the link. Listen to us. And uh, come out and see us in Milwaukee. In the meantime, we will be back next week. With more wine and games. See you next week. Bye-bye. Would you like Dungeons and Dragons sheets? They have Dungeons and Dragons sheets. No. They have well, yeah. They even put those things in her hair, like yeah, ears, little little horns. Horns, yeah. They have a D twenty shaped throw blanket, a D twenty shaped toaster that toasts no. the D and D logo I, I on want, your toast. I want people to walk into the house and not know that we're gamers. Thank you. There's literally two two foot stall <laughs> stacks of games in the living room. I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> when okay. things are tidied. <coughs> Our doorbell plays the Link just found a chest music. <laughs> dee 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 dee. <laughs>